Welcome to the Boswell Book Company virtual event series. Um, it is day 4,548 of us being in business. I'm Daniel Golden from Boswell. Tonight is a Zoom webinar. And so while you don't have a camera or microphone, you do have access to asking questions through the Q&A or chat function. Um, well, we've mentioned a few upcoming events, but they all pale in comparison to tonight's event. We're so honored to welcome Naomi Hirahara, the author of Clark and Division. This is one, part of our Thrill Walking series. Uh, Hirahara is the Edgar Award-winning author of the Maserai, Eli Rush, and Leilani Santiago series. This is a standalone novel set in Chicago during the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, the book has been getting uh, amazing reviews, including S.A. Cosby in the Washington Post, who wrote, um, crime fiction is at its best when telling a compelling story while also analyzing the shadowy foundations of human nature. Very few writers do that better than Hirahara. And it also could be the series called Listen to Carol Barrowman when she tells you to read a book. <laughs> not only did uh, she actually call us our shout out to uh, oh, yeah. Cosby and has done our events with him, but she told me to read Nami Hirahara and what a delight it was. And needless to say, we uh, asked if she would be interested in conversing with the author and everybody said yes, and it is a better world for <laughs> Um Carol Barrowman is a, a writer, a critic, a um, uh, and also a professor at Alverno College. Uh, we are so uh, always delighted to work with her for a charming event. And everybody but me has apparently dyed their hair purple for the evening. <laughs> I'll go work on that during yes, the break. Yes, yes. Do that. Welcome both of you. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, welcome, everybody. And hello, Naomi. It's so I'm so excited to meet you. I have been counting down the days oh. for this. Um, usually what um, and welcome to all of you who are joining us. And thank you so much for um, being here for um, this time on a Tuesday night. Um, it's better than anything else you could be doing. I'm going to guarantee that. Uh, so, well, usually what I uh, do is um, I have a couple of questions. Um, um, I'm going to indulge myself in, in asking those um, of Naomi before we start. And then at some point, um, uh, at some point, I'm going to ask Naomi if you'll read a little bit to us. And also um, later, uh, or as we're going along, I know Naomi has some slides um, of some different things. And so we'll bring those up as, as we're talking. Um, but before, before we um, jump right in and I ask my first question, I have to say that um, I always judge books by their covers. Mm. Um, I, I just, I do. And this one has one of the most stunning covers, I have to say, with um, uh, one of, with uh, the sister, I'm assuming um, we have to see her. I don't know if it's um, Rose or not. It could be Rose coming up as sort of haunting a building or it could be her um, younger sister. Uh, maybe you can tell us that later, um, but um, I love the cover. When I review a book, I don't read any blurbs. I don't read anything on the inside. I just jump right in. Um, and this book from the first paragraph just had me hooked. The voice is so strong and you've got a birth. It opens with birth and um, Goodness gracious, every great story. It's, it's almost epic, the quality um, when you start with birth. And um, this did not, um, it did not let me down in that way. I, um, I, I have to say I read this in one sitting, but I, have, I can indulge myself and do that. That's what I do, right? Um, and I didn't know where, I didn't know where this was going. And I loved that I didn't know where this was going. It starts out is this really intimate family story. And then it blossoms out into being this um, really just poignant, heartbreaking historical tale. And then, then, it, then the mystery is woven throughout. I, I, it, it made my picks for the summer, as you know, um, because I loved it so much. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do for us first, Naomi, is give us your, your elevator speech of your book. 
if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, so Clark and Division is a story of two sisters, Rosanaki, and it's a story about a Japanese American family, the Ito family, who during World War II must move from their home in Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Tropical. And they were incarcerated in um, Manzanar Detention Center, which is in the middle, in the Owens Valley of California, mm -hmm. the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. So there is a early release program that primarily only Nisei, which is second generation Japanese Americans could possibly qualify for. So Rose, the older sister, is granted approval to move to Chicago. And then um, Aki, this, uh, this book is told in the voice of the younger sister, Aki, and she just idolizes her older sister. And so Aki and her parents follow some months later to Chicago, only to find out that something tragic has happened to Rose. And it's up to Aki, the younger sister, to figure out what happened, as well as to carry her parents, her immigrant parents, through this tumultuous transitional time in their lives. So that's essentially the ele ele elevator pitch. And, and um, that, that's great. Thank you so much. The, there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about in terms of the story. And um, I know that you have done an immense amount of research on this time period. Um, and um, and have written about it as a journalist, actually. I mean, I, you were an acclaimed editor for a, a newspaper in California for a very long time. Um, did the history, did you ever think that this was just go, gonna be a history book? Why choose the mystery genre to, to examine and explore these two sisters' lives and the period? Well, I, I love the, his, uh, the mystery genre because I think for a couple of reasons, um, there's usually a crime. And, um, you know, when you're talking about ethnic communities, sometimes there's this pressure to put on this really happy face or, you know, be these model minorities, which really may not be representative of their experience. So just the genre itself, I think even the community is more accepting, like, oh, this is a mystery. So there's an expectation there will be a crime. Um, so I think that benefits it, um, a, a tale like this. And the other thing is, um, I think one thing that kind of drove me crazy about um, documenting this period of time is when the government took photos, usually, you know, everyone was immaculately dressed, beautiful, you know, hair and all this, but I knew that wasn't the reality of their lives. Um, but I think people were trying to make a you know, nice face. And they were also looking towards the future. You know, they wanted a better future for themselves and their children. So they were kind of not grin and bear it, but perhaps they weren't um, exposing everything that was going, the darkness that, was, that they had uh, experienced. Where, whereas in a crime novel, there is something traumatic that happens. And as a result, the Ito family, they can't just, okay, well, let's just persevere and forget about what happened to us. You know, Aki has to face kind of this larger crime, this political crime that's befallen them, as well as this personal crime. So I, I and it also gives um, my, uh, her agency, you know, because she is a, um, kind of an amateur sleuth. She mm -hmm. does detecting. So I just love that about our genre, that um, it forces the protagonist to be active. That, that's a really good um, description of, of how those two things come together. And I also, um, I, I think one of the, the wonderful things about the genre is that it is very much a genre about morality, right? I mean, you've got life and death, but you are, you're also exploring some very pointed kinds of um, tragic morale, moral issues that happened. Um, can you say a little more about the history and how you personally are connected to the, that, the story? Um, are you second generation? I, you know, this is the interesting part. Um, probably out of all of my novels, I, I'm actually kind of an outsider 
to this book in the sense that my parents were not incarcerated. They were in Japan. My father was born in a place called Watsonville, California, which was kind of like the salad bowl. It was like John Steinbeck kind of country. And when he was a child, he and his uh, older siblings um, were taken to Hiroshima. So he, he's a uh, atomic bomb survivor as my mother was, is, was too, is too. Um, she, uh, she was eight years old at the time, but she was a Japanese national. So that's kind of, I have another series, the Masarai series, which is a more inspired by my father's experience. But I really think it was working at the paper, which newspaper, it was a Japanese American newspaper. It's still around today, believe it or not. It was started in 1903, and um, I worked there in the 80s and 90s, um, not uh, and not continuously, but as but anyway. So when a big topic was the redress and reparations for people who had been incarcerated, so um, this was a wonderful initiation for me to learn more about what happened to Japanese Americans. I think, of course, if I was alive during that time, I would have been in one right. of those camps. So. Right. There's that direct, that kind of connection, but of there's no kind of, um, although my father's relatives, his cousins and aunt and uncle from Watsonville, they were, um, they, uh, for a particular, uh, for a, uh, a time period, they kind of lost their beautiful Victorian house and they were incarcerated in Arkansas, but they eventually returned back to California and got their house and, um, so their property back. So, you know, I think if you're Japanese Americans, you can't help, you know, it is part of our community's right. history, right? Yep. Yeah. It's, well, it's part of your community's stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the thing that struck me as I was reading this book is, as I said before, you start with such an intimate personal moment, right? The birth of a child and the, um, and, and the voice that, that, that is so strong throughout this novel. It, it really, I mean, you're immersed in, in um, the, 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 the narrative voice, but here's the thing that, that I, 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 I did not know this much about it. I mean, I went to school on this book and, I, and I'm saying that it's, not, it's a novel and it's a beautifully written novel, but it's a novel that is so rich in its history that, um, I, I was, I did not question it at any moment when I was reading this, that what I was getting was an authentic historical story expressed as a novel. It, does, does that make sense? I yeah. mean, it was just beautiful. It was really important for this novel because there's not much written and there will be in the future, but there's not so far, there's not that much written about people being released and where did they go and what happened after camp and that was something um, my friend Heather Lindquist and I wrote about in a nonfiction book called Life After Manzanar. So that's when I you know I knew that a lot of people had lived in Chicago I had the subjects that I had interviewed from the paper you know had spent mm -hmm. some time in Chicago or even decided to live there for until retirement. And um, I didn't really put two and two together until the nonfiction book. And th there I learned that um, Chicago was the number one destination for Japanese Americans. Which um, I did not camp. know. Yeah, I mean, and, and one reason why is the government kind of put out the message, do not congregate, you know, in large numbers, do not put anything permanent. Like here in California, we have three or four Japan towns, you know, and right. um, but they were not encouraged they were discouraged from uh, creating something like that so even in present day chicago there's it's kind of erased so i think that's one thing i wanted to do with my book too is to kind of put a post you know like hey yep. you know this happened and actually everything in the book even the crimes um they're based on um like a piece of information that i got in a document that was recording the crimes that had taken place or else in the newspaper. So I, I, you know, I really felt because a lot of people didn't want to talk about Clark and division was an intersection. It was a way station. It was 
the first place that people went to and they quickly went to uh, scattered to other places, but it was very chaotic. And I really wanted to um, in, uh, capture, you know, how chaotic it was because I think um, people didn't want to carry that experience with them, but I think it's informative to everyone, even family members to kind of honor that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think you, you, you do that really well. Before we look at some slides, I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the sisters um, and as the main characters. Um, tell me a little bit about their evolution um, as you were imagining them um, and, uh, and play, placing them in the novel. Because one of the things, well, let me back up for a minute. The novel is really organized according to three big thing, big big areas. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. first one is sort of their lives before they are um, um, sent to the constant the, the camps, and then then there's their um, when they're released and they're in the they're you know they're in the camp and figuring out where to go, and then there's Chicago, and you bring um, the diary into it much more towards that last part, so that we get Rose's diary and then her voice. Can you say just a little bit about well, the sisters, and then what, what, what were your, what were your decision-making process a little bit to place them that way in the book? Um, yeah, I knew that, you know, even though, you know, this historic event deserved coverage, but this is a mystery, this right. is a novel, so there's got to be some other story, and um, I was, kind of, I'm actually an older sister. So again, I'm an outsider to Octi because <laughs> I'm the older sister. I only have a brother. I don't even have a sister, but I would um, observe like people around me who were the younger sisters to a star sister mm -hmm. and how that dynamic played out. And I thought that was really fascinating. So I was just wondering what would happen if the older sister was gone, you know, would the younger sister be able to, find her voice and pull herself together and pull her family with her, you know? And I thought that was intriguing. So even, um, I don't know if you wanted me to read like the first couple of paragraphs. Yeah, um, let's, let's do that because I think it sets up their dynamics immediately. Yeah, and I could talk a little bit about Absolutely. why I decided to write that. So chapter one, Rose was always there even while I was being born. It was a preach birth. The midwife, soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mother's, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot good and hard. Ito-san! The midwife's voice cut through the chaos and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran, Pop couldn't catch her at first and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. So That's like beautiful. even during Aki's birth, like Rose is the star of the right. show. Right, right. And we don't even know Aki's voice until a few pages in, you know, right. so. But on the other hand, uh, Aki is a breech birth. So there's something unusual about Aki that she, she does not even realize herself until like the book kind of progresses, so in uh, Clark and Division, it's also about Aki um, finding her voice mm -hmm. and finding who she is and what she wants. It's really, you've really got two journeys going on here, right? You've got the physical movement of this family, and then you've got the, the um, philosophical and the internal journey and development and growth of, uh, of, of Aki and how she, um, begins to stand up for so much more than she thought she ever could, right? Yeah, and um, you know, I did talk to my editor about the structure because I know in some ways, you know, okay, the birth and then again, camp and then Chicago, you know, um, some authors would choose to start off in, straight in Chicago, you know, or some people might decide to, you know, alternate uh, 
different chapters, you know, skip around in time. Right. Um, actually, my agent, she felt really strongly that I needed to show the family before, you know, before the, and I, I agreed with her. And one thing, Julia, my um, editor, she said, Naomi, just don't feel like you have to rush mm -hmm. the beginning. Just, you know, just, and then I, I, you know, because it was shorter, you know, because I was thinking, oh, I have to jump over to Chicago. Yeah. But there's so many things like I assume, oh, everybody knows this information, you know, but they, and people don't. So um, I'm glad, you know, I didn't, to tell you quite honestly, I, I really didn't know how the book would be received because I kind of take this language journey through, through Aki's mm -hmm. um, life, but I thought it was also important to show, you know, because of the racism and discrimination. And it's not like, oh, you know, super in your face. It's just little things that kind of mm -hmm. have chipped away at Aki, you know, in, in her, during her early years. I think that's a great word that you just used was languid because even though I felt as I was reading it that I was heading towards something because I'm embedded in the genre, right? I knew I was going somewhere. Yeah. I didn't know what it was going to be though, because I hadn't read the cover. So I didn't know that Rose, what happens to Rose was a complete and utter shock to me. And it, it worked so well at that point because I already felt like, oh, she's, someone's going to, she, she's got her sister now is going to look out, is going to have to come to grips with herself in the, in the community. So I love, I really, really appreciated that line, that pay, that the pacing, it's so measured at the beginning, but it's not, it's not, not pacey if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, we tried to choose the right scenes um, for Aki, you know, and I think, you know, I mean, throughout the whole book, um, her relationship with her sister, you know, re remains top of mind. And um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, one professor read my book and she she kind of viewed Rose as a femme fatale, which, which kind of surprised me. But I think in the sense mm. that you don't really know who she is, right? And there's like hints, you know, through her her uh, journal, but even her journal, I didn't want to use the journal in your typical way, like all this, everything will be revealed in the journal. Because when I think about my own journal, you know, I sometimes, you know, write around things. Oh, me too. <laughs> or, <you> yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. Or you, or you have those words that you underline them three times thinking that in a month when I come back to that, I'll know what the underlines meant, right? Right, right. Yeah, and and yeah. you need to unpack them. Um, maybe we can show a few of your slides because I think um, the other thing that's awesome about this book, my friends, is you got a map. And um, so t tell us, uh, narrate them a little bit for us here, uh, Naomi. So this is the Oshima family and... This was actually a government photo, but I thought this actually uh, was more poignant than most of them. Um, they came from a play, they're, they're originally from Sacramento and then arrived in Chicago to go into a hostel. And it just like the expressions on everyone's face, you know, they're like, what is gonna happen to them, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I thought um, that was an apt photo. Um, I, I love, historic photos I love postcards so these um, one of the characters and this is the neat thing about writing a book like Clark and Division there's multiple characters with multiple right. experiences different people react to the camp experience to Amer being American you know and that's that's uh, was great for me because I didn't it, it's not like the stories just from Aki's eyes you know people should who she grew up with, they have a different take on things. And one of the um, kind of outsiders is a guy named Hammer, who's an orphan and was a zoot suitor, um, you know, wearing baggy pants. And um, actually, there was one detail um, that an academic had written that um, they wore chains, right? This was from East LA. And they stole the um, chains from the stoppers in from the sinks and camp to get to make that chain. I go, that is like such that a is, great detail. Oh my gosh, that's awesome! And that could be Hammer in this picture. It could be. It could be. So, um, 
So I, I wanted to include a character like Hammer. He has gotten into some trouble because again, I didn't want to show this homogeneous um, you know, characters. They're, they all are different. Some were troublemakers. Right. Um, I'm not from Chicago. So you know, what, what really helped him in the back is an extensive uh, bibliography um, because I read a lot of oral histories and things like that. And they're all accessible over the internet. But there's nothing like stepping foot into the place, right? So right. I took two research um, trips to Chicago. And this is Eric Matsunaga, my friend, who's the uh, local um, historian. And he, you know, kind of, we walked the streets of Clark and Division. There's nothing, there's like a huge Osco drugstore. There's some, there's, but um, there were some things that were remaining. So Eric was the one who kind of helped me with this map that was transformed into the map that's into the, uh, the beautiful um, transformation yeah. Um, that's yeah. in, yeah. But um, here, one building that's still there is the Mark Twain Hotel. And um, this is a postcard from there. And there's a beautician, there's a, there was a real life beauty shop in um, the hotel. And when you read, uh, when I read her oral history, she talked about the cross dressers, you know, the entertainers, wow. because there was kind of a red light district, you know, further north on Clark. Right. So I, right. I thought that was fascinating. So of course, that's part of the book. And yeah. there's some last vestiges. This is like in near Wrigley Field. Oh, this is the, the hairdresser, the Mark Twain beauty oh, box. That's awesome. The Mark Twain beauty box. I <laughs> love it. Well, and this was the other thing that I loved about this one. I, I, did, I went to graduate school in Illinois in a, a Northern Illinois University. And so the city that we would go into on the weekends would be Chicago. And so I did a great deal of my research um, for uh, my graduate program in at the Newberry. So I love that the Newberry was in a sense a character in this book. Well, it was, um, the reason why is I dedicated, one of the three women I dedicated the book to was this woman, Sukuni Tomi Embry, and she has since passed, but she was an activist who um, actually made it, was one of the people who made it possible for Manzanar to be a national park. Um, but she was from LA, she was in Manzanar, and she worked at the Newberry. And she was just saying what a great experience that was for her. Actually, she had lived in, she, first she was in Wisconsin oh, wow. from um, Manzanar, but there weren't as many jobs. So ah. that's why she went into Chicago. Makes sense. And, and by the way, um, before World War II, there were 400 Japanese Americans in Chicago. By the mid forties, there were 20,000. Wow. So wow. that was, that just shows you how much, you know, people were flocking there. So um, when, when Eric was showing me Clark and Division, I go, wait a minute, Newberry, it's close by, let's go. I was very ignorant because I thought Newberry library was just like another not library. Yeah. And then when we went to this grand building, I was like blown away. And I was thinking, what would it like to be a character that you know had come from LA, been incarcerated with ten thousand other Japanese Americans in Bestie Barracks, and all of a sudden you go to Chicago and you're working in this grand, beautiful building, you know. So I thought the contrast was fascinating. So that's why I had to. It, and and, and I think it played. It worked really well. I, I had uh, um, we had somebody ask on in the chat, um, Mary uh, Geithner. Gutner, I forgive me, Mary, but Mary asked if um, the photos were part of the um, end papers in the book, and and they're they're unfortunately they're not. But in your other book that you mentioned, do you have photographs? So maybe yes. you, why don't you pitch that? And if you want to buy it, Daniel will order it for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's from a, a Berkeley-based press called Heyday. It's an independent press, and it's called life after Manzanar. So those photos, it, it's, there's a lot of photos in there. So yeah, um, many of these photos were in there. Good. That's um, awesome. Th this is where she's from, tropical yep. farming. Um, so this if is, you, yeah. could you go back again for a minute? So sure. are the, is that your squig squiggles and scribbles? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did do the a, same thing. Well, I did a writing workshop and I've been doing um, just drawings because it's just like something different 
And I just sort of explained like, why did, why did I set, set it in tropical? And um, nobody really knows that this area in LA is called tropical. It's by Glendale in Los Angeles. Huh. But then I interviewed someone and he was saying, we grew up in tropical and I'm going, where's tropical? And um, I'm a type of person when I hear something interesting, I just kind of, my mind just holds on to it. And um, so I had heard this like decades ago and it just so happened that um, Clark and Division was the right place to release it. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that's amazing. When you were mapping out the um, walking around Chicago, did you create, did you have all the places in mind or was, were you starting fresh? In other words, did you know that this is where the candy store was gonna be? And, or did, did you just, you knew what these settings were and then you had to fit them in or did it just sort of evolve much more organically as you walked around in the area? Well, luckily, as you can see, it's a congested area. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and, and so that was good because it's kind of a walk, she's walking a lot. I mean, she does take some uh, transportation but um he's always moving right yeah yeah she moves in yeah. bi from big places but she is always walking I'm, that's really interesting i hadn't really thought about that but you're right yeah and i'm a walker myself Are you? so in, in in that yeah and i think you see things differently when you walk and um there's things like there's a filipino barbershop which there really was it's not on this map but it, you know, all these li little characters of the town, um, the gambling, you know, areas, you know, all of those are based on real places. So I do kind of think that, you know, I was sticking a pin in these various locations and then thinking of organic ways. And, and luckily, um, I didn't have to push it. You know, it, it just seemed like once I released Rose, she was just her, not Ro Aki, she would, she would just naturally go to all these places. So it was, I was just following her. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And this was uh, a cemetery. There was a Japanese mausoleum there. And that was true too, that Japanese Americans were refused at a lot of cemeteries. So the, this group, the mutual aid um, group, they created this mausoleum so people could put their ashes in there. So um, yeah, and there are remnants. Um, I didn't really get into the Buddhist temples, but they didn't really have much Buddhist temples before uh, huh. World War II. So it's just kind of interesting. And, you know, the, this clan, the actual fun fu funeral house uh, parlor was, uh, was based on a real place as well. Yeah. So, so I had a, um, thank you for those. And thank you for sharing. I, I'm so glad you brought those uh, along with you. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I have a couple other questions and then um, let me just ask the um, folks in the audience, if you have some questions, you can put them in the Q and A or you can put them in the chat and we'll go through them in, in a few, a few minutes. Um, we started the, the conversation talking a little bit about the, the moral, um, aspects of, of a mystery. And um, it, it seems to me one of the big things that, that you raise other than, I mean, there's a lot of big things, obviously, um, but uh, the idea of um, sort of vigilante justice um, versus um, the justice that's official, but because of institutionalized racism and, and everything goes along with that, the chances of, of your characters achieving that are, um, are pretty thin. Can you speak a little bit to that particular um, moral part of the book, the, a theme that I, I thought um, you handled really well, but can you speak a little bit to that? Well, the, you know, there was actually, um, I, I don't want to spoil the book, so I don't no, want to get give away, too no much, spoiler. but I will say there was a, a actual like report of a certain, criminal activity. And I know the, um, that particular criminal was never brought to justice because I would, we would have heard about it. You know, it right. would have been written up and just the fact, um, that it, you know, it was very new to me. Um, I, I felt in a way I wanted to bring that person to justice in the book. 
as well as um, just acknowledge that um, some people had, you know, really gone through a lot and had really suffered in silence, I'm assuming. So, um, so through fiction, I, I felt like, not that I'm writing a wrong, but just acknowledging that something had happened, so. Right, right. I think, I th yes, and I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to say any more about it, but I, I, I do think that um, that is one of the things that um, it, it, is the most wonderful thing about writing a historical novel like that like this is because you can you can make things go your way mm -hmm. and and there was um, it, some other institutional criminal <laughs> in, institutionalized criminal activity i mean it's chicago right right and right things chicago. happen in chicago yep. so that was actually based on a true incident that i had uh, read and described in a history book and then you know I dug I through newspapers.com you know I I was able right. to read more of what happened so yeah some people may you know sure there's some a few maybe fantastic things that happen fantastic is like is it did this could this really happen but most of it um re was really based on true incidents and I, I, I know I said this earlier in our conversation, really the authenticity is, it comes through in every layer of, of the book. It absolutely does. Um, so we have a couple of, let's see, we have a couple of questions here. Um, Donna Niebauer says, a beautiful story. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Um, and then uh, someone is asking, how did you choose the name Rose and any connection to Rose uh, to Taguri, Taguri. So that's um, Iva Taguri. She was um, prosecuted for being Tokyo Rose. Yes, yes. You know, and and then she was later pardoned for that because they could not. You know, it was just in the propaganda. It was just used, and you know, they don't really don't know who Tokyo Rose really was. You know, if it's just like uh, just a creation um, of uh, the Japanese government, you know, um, but um, no, it wasn't. Um, someone else had <laughs> asked me that um, because I'm a Pasadena girl, um, I, <laughs> you know, I just like wrote, and then there's a lot of Nisei um, that I have very fond memories of named Rose. So I, I, I just seized upon that, you know, but, it's kind of, I don't know, but who knows sub subconsciously what's happening? Because right. um, actually when uh, Aki is just w walking, you know, to Rose's uh, old apartment, you know, she's being leered at by men and someone's, you know, like, hey, geisha, and someone says Tokyo Rose to her. So maybe something was in my mind that I didn't, I really realize. I mean, yeah, who knows? Well, it and her and it's interesting because her name is the name that's a little more western right yes and and that and and she is the the character who is trying to assimilate more and and so uh maybe something there too yeah that i do mention there's a lot of different easter eggs in the book actually the toguris had a mercantile business and um Aki does wander into that business. I mean, it's you wouldn't even hardly notice it, but she met. She calls it to, the Toguris because it really existed. So um, tell us a few more. Give us a few more. Well, my my father in law was with the hundredth four four two regimental combat team. It's kind of interesting when I did another one of these virtual programs, and um, the person, my interlocutor or interviewer, she was unaware that people were um, drafted, Japanese Americans were actually oh. drafted, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that's kind of a big part of the Japanese American experience, just the stories like, you know, they're in camp, they lost everything, but the government is now drafting them into the army, you know, how ironic is that? And it turns out they were, you know, the, one of the most decorated, you know, uh, military uh, teams um, per capita. And so my own um, father-in-law, you know, had fought in um, 
Europe and had gotten wounded and got a silver star and all this stuff. So, but he was kind of a big guy. So he was charged with holding the Browning, the machine gun. So right. there, I, I kind of describe him in a correspondence that Aki's having with another person. So, yeah, so there's, oh, and there's um, niece, names of Nisei that were my mother's friends. My mother's still alive, but these friends are no longer living. So, you know, Chiyo and Tomi, you know, all of those, you know, is just my uh, salute to them in our lives. Um, yeah, so I, awesome. I think people, other people, they're not really Easter eggs because no one else would know, but you know, a small group of people. <laughs> but I, but I, again, that's one of the privileges when you're the author, you get to do some of that. What'd your mom think when she read the, what, did she get to read it in pieces or did you save it till the end to share? Well, my mother uh, will never admit that she's read anything I've written. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because I was at a, a program. This is a way back when with Attica Locke. I think oh, yeah. Attica, it, she, her first book was just published and she was saying, oh, my mother, you know, she, you know, she just really supports Attica verbally. You know, she's very expressive right. in her yep. support. Yep. And then it was like, yeah, my mother won't even admit that she reads anything of mine. And people are like, what? You know, but she does show her support. Like whenever we, I, we had in-person events, she would make all the food, she'd make sushi or you know, this, that, that's her love language. I think for her, um, because I'm not from a family of writers necessarily, uh, right. and it's just um, such a weird thing, you know, and especially writing like stories like this, you kind of are concerned, what will people think of it? us you know is this a reflection of who we are and, right right you know so she's gonna make is she gonna make us look bad yeah yeah so i think she's kind of self-conscious so it's it's okay you know i that's fine we just have a different kind of relationship <laughs> that's and that that's okay that's okay um again um those of you who are um joining us if you have any other questions please go ahead and put them in the Q and A or in the chat. I think um, we've got most. Of my, I, I wanted to ask while we're waiting to see if anyone else wants to post a question, um, and then I'm going to ask you to bring us uh, to an end by reading again another piece for us, if you, sure. if you will. Sure. But um, so from once you started writing this, how long did it take you? Do you, would you say? Because I know the research has been a lifetime of gathering. Well, um, I think. I, so I went to Chicago uh, in 2017, and I went in 2018. Um, and uh, I had to actually write a, a big chunk of it during the pandemic uh -huh. and rewrites. And um, that was, it was interesting because actually the confinement that all of us were experiencing, mm -hmm. um, I think it was helpful for me to kind of channel and see things from Aki's point of view, just like, uh, you know, I think we're experiencing it right now because right? We, we are now released, but it's not hundred percent and we don't know how to do things, right? Because right? I was just at the Printer's Row uh, a book festival, which was in person. And one of yeah. my colleagues was saying, he, she didn't know how to act. <laughs> know, around like, people you know and um i know do you take do you shake someone's hand now or do you are you you know it's like yeah. how what are we doing yeah but it's just shocking to see people in, you know <laughs> in person i mean especially a large group and i think that mindset helped me to understand aki's isolation also she's always with her parents not that i live with my parents but the fact that our social worlds have gotten so small, right? In during the pandemic. And that's how Aki's was. So I think that um, that what we kind of went through kind of informed. And of course, when there was so much, you know, um, scapegoating of certain right. Asians, especially Asian immigrants, but not only, yeah. um, that th I guess that was more fuel for me, like, oh, okay you know, this is a story that people need to know that it just didn't appear, you know, during um, right. the COVID-19, but yeah. 
it, you know, it's been part of people's lives for a very long time. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's part of that. Um, it, it's another one of those American narratives that we haven't w been willing to read and share. And, and I, another reason why I think this book is really important for us um, to read. So if you, if you wouldn't mind, um, sure. Let's reading an, another section for us before we um okay so i i will um this is a scene where um aki goes to her sister's um, former apartment um two firm raps with my knuckles the rattling turn of a lock and the door opened to reveal a thin nisei woman with brownish hair curled up around the nape of her neck Although it was dark in the hallway, there was soft light from some lamps inside. The woman who looked a little older than me wore a fitted tan dress and raspberry red lipstick. She seemed to know what looked attractive on her skinny frame. I'm Rose's sister, I said. The woman's face fell. Her eyes and red lips sloped down and she seemed frozen for a moment. I'm so sorry, she finally said. Come in, come in. The room held three twin beds, two of them on opposite sides and another that almost blocked the door. Dresses on hangers were suspended from nails high on the wall. The wallpaper beside one of the beds had peeled off, revealing a long crack stained brown by a possible water leak. There was a small refrigerator and a hot plate in a corner, but no sink. Aki, right? I've seen a photo of you. Rose spoke about you all the time. I'm Louise. The door opened again and another woman entered, a towel around her neck. She had big eyes and heavy eyebrows that seemed drawn on, but were probably all natural. She looked like one of those healthy farm girl types that could outwork most men. Hello, she said enthusiastically upon laying eyes on me. This is Rose's sister, Louise said, a, said in a hushed tone. Aki, oh, I'm Chio, she extended her hand. It felt pillowy and soft until she squeezed. I frowned for a moment. Chio didn't seem like she was from San Francisco and I didn't re recognize her name. I think there was another roommate. Oh, you must be talking about Tomi, Louise said. She moved out a few months ago. She's a house girl in Eviston now. Couldn't deal with the big city. I took Tommy's spot. I was living in a hallway before, so this sure is a thousand times better. Chio folded her, her towel on a hanger and placed it on one of the nails on the wall. When she turned back around, her cheeks were a little flushed. I didn't know your sister that long. We didn't talk much, but I sure am sorry. That's great. What a great scene. That And, and the description in that scene is just the right amount of detail to see the room and the bunk beds. And then my favorite is the eyebrows that look drawn on, but they probably weren't. <laughs> just great details. Um, any, if, if last chance here for some questions, if you have any, let me see. Um, I think we looked, we got those two. Um, and I don't see any other ones under the chat. Um, so, this was just a delight. As I said before, I, um, I, I loved everything about this book. And I actually realized when I was um, doing some more research that I think I read, is it Fisher, Ellie, your, Ellie Fisher, the bicycle detective? Yeah, Ellie Rush. I Ellie Rush. Uh, Ellie Rush, right. Yeah. Ellie yeah. Rush. I don't know why I'm thinking Fisher. Um, Ellie Rush. Um, I, I love, I think I read one of those really early ones. And so now I'm going to have to go back and, and, and pick. So uh, pick up some of those other ones. Thank you. All of you who are joining Thank us. You. Daniel, if you can come back on, there you are. Thank you for joining us um, at this Boswell virtual event. And thank you so much. Naomi, for your sharing your insights about process and writing. And um, everyone get this book. You won't regret it. Thank you. If you um, click on the link now, it'll stay there after uh, you go, the event goes away. Um, just in case we have always have people, we have a wonderful book plate that comes with the book, but just in case somebody wanted say a book personalized or uh, wanted an actual signed copy instead of virtual, is there a bookstore they can go to in LA? that has signed copies or who can take requests? 
Um, probably uh, uh, there's two places. One is the museum store for the Japanese American National Museum. I, I signed a bunch of books for them um, and which they wrapped. So, you know, there's a limited amount. And um, I would say probably Roman's bookstore, you could request. Um, that's my local bookstore there. Yeah, let's see if I can get, um, let's see if we can get that link in for folks too. Um, we love the folks at Roman. So um, here we go. I found it. And I'm just gonna send that to people. So if you want a signed copy or maybe even a personalization request, this is probably the place who can do it. So yeah. tell them Carol and Daniel sent. Yes. So, yeah, you know, just put a little that. request. There's a little right. yeah. note. Um, yeah, there. Thanks everybody for coming. We wouldn't have a virtual bookstore without you. Hope to see you at another event. Thank you as always to Carol Brown. It's been uh, an honor to host uh, Naomi Hirohara. Um, and I hope to see you in person. That's yes, right. Someday, yeah. someday. I'm going to BoucherCon Minneapolis. Oh, well, then I, I next I, year. Six hours. That, oh, yeah. That's not too far. Maybe Dan, Dan, Daniel and I can ride up together. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we'll be, yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll be in a big crowd. Trying to <laughs> <talk to people. laughs> yeah.